<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, this session is being recorded. If you look in the uh, upper left corner, you'll see it's being recorded, right? Yes, you can see it's recording. Yeah. Good, you're good. All right. Now, I know there's not that many of us but uh, for today, but just uh, if you guys can make sure to mute your mic when you're not speaking so we don't get any background noise, uh, that would be highly appreciated. Okay, so we are going, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. We are going to continue with Mr. Michel Foucault. Everyone can see the PowerPoint? Yes. Cool. And you guys know there's like little, there's a chat function, there's like little emoji functions too. Yeah, there you go. Thumbs up. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> okay. So today's topic, uh, and by the way, today is uh, the first. Uh, you know, everyone almost wishes like somebody would just come out and say, surprise, guys, this is all just a big prank. Uh, you can go back to school now. Doesn't seem that way. Um, I was actually talking with uh, Mr. LeConte yesterday, and uh, he and I love pranking students on April Fools, but um, every single year that you guys have been in high school, uh, April Fools has landed on a weekend, and so we haven't done an April Fools prank, and we were planning one this year, and then this happened, so <laughs> we unfortunately were not able to uh, do any of those kind of things. Oh well. Uh, the homework for today is really simple. It's actually only a little bit of uh, reading, uh, pages 17 to 20, and then discussion board number 10, which has already been posted up on Schoology, which I understand is down. Um, that's okay. Oh, you know, I, I want to ask, uh, guys, I, 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 for, for my class, uh, how does the homework feel so far? Like, so the reading and then the discussion board. It's good. Yeah, it's really helping a lot with, like, for example, other classes and managing. It's, yeah, really it's very good. well spaced. I know. Yes, it's really I, well I like it. Okay, I mean, well, just just give me, I really appreciate any feedback you could give me in case you think it's too little or it's too much or whatever. I mean, I really would appreciate any feedback. I mean, all your teachers are just trying to figure it out at this point, folks. <laughs> okay, so today's main topic is docile bodies, which uh, I assure you is not like a weird thing. It's, it's, it's part of his, uh, Foucault's system of discipline, which is what we started talking about uh, on uh, Monday. So everyone uh, ready? You're ready to like just take quick notes, either on a post-it or on a little notebook or on a Word doc. Or uh, uh, today's actually, uh, we have a thought experiment. Uh, and that's actually the discussion board for today. So we'll be able to discuss that together. Sound good? Yes. Yeah. Okay, God. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Okay, so a quick review, because I know I, I normally haven't had a chance to do this because with the YouTube live stream, which is really awkward to get everyone talking, but uh, the discussion board from yesterday, or I'm sorry, from Monday, uh, we talked about the differences between a public execution and a timetable. Which do you think is a more humane punishment, public executions or timetables and why? Uh, let, let's get a few, uh, oh, and in order to keep the conversation as organized as possible, do you guys see the little raise hand function next to participants? Oh, there you go. Okay, Dorothy, start us off. Okay, so I still stand with like the idea that like the times table is more humane, simply because I feel like execution is just the ultimate inhumane thing to do. I don't feel like humans have the like, I just don't think it's a humane thing to like kill or like take life away from another human being. Um, so I feel like that execution is the ultimate humane and also like i get like times table is not ideal because it is like a very rigorous punishment and extremely like grueling um but i still feel like it keeps like the individual's like consciousness like alive i guess so i was i i err more on like the side of yeah times table being more humane okay excellent all right let's get another point of view uh, fiona and then daphna Fiona? Sorry, I could yeah, sorry, I could not unmute. I don't know why. You're but right. um, you know, for me, uh, I had a hard time <laughs> yesterday um, figuring out which one would be the worst because I always go back to Wittgenstein and think about language and culture. And <laughs> I said I can't, you know, the language and the culture that we utilize. How do we know that the the society didn't make us like, for example, Gilead? viewing this uh, like the ceremony as good instead of rape just the same as how we view for example if we say oh you know taking a life is actually not humane but what if it is humane if it wasn't the language that we utilize or the culture that we're in like what is humane in our culture 
and the humane process not taking away a life, but how do we know that it's actually, you know, <laughs> you know, humane? So I, <laughs> I always go back to Wittgenstein, and it just hurts to do the, uh, <laughs> the questions because I can't take it off my mind now. But yes, okay. No, Fiona, I think that's very insightful, and I'm really glad that you remembered what we learned with Wittgenstein. I, I think you're right. I think in order to answer this question, we first should kind of define what we mean by humane. I think Dorothy was mentioning, you know, uh, uh, not taking a life as being part of being humane. But, but I guess you're right to question the definition. Because in physical, like, uh, in the physical way, obviously, the public execution is much worse. Like, you have, obviously, not only the pain of that torture, but also the judgment of the, expe the like, spectators. But when it comes to the times table, that's forever. You're living within this system forever. And so you're, you know, it's, it's kind of scary to think that maybe we're indoctrinated to think that it's good of what we're living right now. Because when we were reading the articles, that was much of my life. <laughs> it was scary. <laughs> I mean, yeah, 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 you're right. I mean, we're used to um, to timetables, and so perhaps we have a bias towards them. Okay, no, you bring up a good point, a cultural bias, a linguistic bias. Uh, uh, Daphne? Um, so, in some ways, I do agree with Fiona that, like, it depends on the perspective that you're coming from when it comes to this, like, which one is more humane. But I seriously think that the public execution is a lot more inhumane for the reason that it not only affects the criminal, but it also affects um, the spectators and the people around them in a really negative way. Because regardless of whether you think you enjoy it or not, seeing someone getting killed is a very traumatic experience, especially in such a violent way. So it has like, obviously it's killing someone, which is like bad in general, but then it's also just having such a terrible effect on so many other people when a timetable only affects the criminal in a negative way. Mm, okay, so you would say it's more humane uh, at the timetable because that more affects the individual, whereas a public execution, you know, it has this effect on a whole crowd. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's very insightful. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, hold on. Ah, it, it says two participants raise hand, but it doesn't tell me who. I have to, like, check. That seems to be Dorothy. Dorothy, go ahead. Okay, so actually, Fiona made me think of something. Um, you know Midsummer? Yeah. So, like, okay, when they, oh, you like... watched it? Yeah, yeah, wow. I watched it. yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I watched it. Um, and like you know when they like have to like jump off that cliff because like they think like the aging process is like less humane than just dying. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it made me think of. So thank you, Fiona. <laughs> I'm glad you made a connection to a film you watched. Uh, oh, I imagine you guys are watching a lot of movies uh, during this quarantine, right? More like shows. Shows. Yeah, I'm watching shows more than movies, but... That's good. I mean, oh, quick digression. I started watching Tiger King uh, last night. It's wild. <laughs> if you haven't watched it, I'd recommend it. It's crazy. Ugh. Anyway, okay, sorry. Quick digression. Really good. Okay, now for the second question, what's the purpose behind both these messes? Because believe it or not, a public execution and a timetable, Foucault claims, actually try to accomplish the same thing. What is that? I'll give you a hint. It was the title of yesterday's lecture <laughs> and a word that I've been using a lot. Okay, hold on. Uh, someone hasn't participated today, just so I know you're there. Christine, Sophia, Nolan, Elisa. All right, Christine. It's to like discipline people because they need to know that they're being controlled. Excellent. Precisely. That's right. It all go, comes down to discipline and control. Uh, Nolan, you want to add on to that? Whoa, shoot. Sorry. Nolan, want to add on to mm, that? I don't. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's good. Okay. All right. Well, that was just a quick review of yesterday. And so everything that we're building towards is uh, Foucault claims that we live in what he calls a disciplinary society. Okay. And yes, everything boils down to discipline. By the way, uh, the little chat box isn't obscuring the view of the PowerPoint, is it? Or, or it is? No. It's not? Okay, good, good, good. Just checking, just checking. Okay. So here is what we're going to do for the next few weeks. We are going to be going over something called disciplinary power and techniques of normalization. In other words, Foucault actually has a step-by-step -step process of how to discipline people in an institution. 
And these are the steps. One, docile bodies. Two, the means of correct training. Three, panopticism. And finally, four, establishing the other. So we're going to go over, those are actually our next uh, uh, four lessons, including the one for today. And so, uh, again, uh, I will be making this PowerPoint uh, available on Schoology once we're done, uh, and I am recording this so you can watch this later. But these are going to be our main topics for the next several weeks. And today we're focusing on just number one, docile bodies. Capiche? I know you guys are muted, but it's a little disconcerting just talking to nobody. Capiche? Thank you. <laughs> All right, here we go. Well, that's going to be your focus for today. All right. Let's do a little thought experiment. <laughs> I thought that was my sister, Mr. Fuentes. <laughs> you, heard you heard that? Wait, is the sound effect working? It's sure. it definitely louder yeah. for you than for no, I, Yeah, no, I definitely thought it was like in, in your room. I said, what's going on? <laughs> Uh, okay, okay. I really like this thought experiment. It has a lot to do with, um, uh, with obviously with Foucault and with discipline. So here we go. Here's the scenario. You guys ready? Okay. Imagine that you are a parent. Let's assume that you, like most reasonable parents, obviously want your kid to behave and be good. One day, you take your child to the supermarket and they start to throw a terrible tantrum because you refuse to get them the cereal they wanted. They start screaming and throwing food items on the floor. The scene is getting so bad that people are starting to stare. What do you do and why? Answer thoroughly and think about the implications of discipline. <laughs> okay, so let's assume you're this parent and let's assume your kid is throwing this wild tantrum. What do you do? Uh, oh, one thing I'm trying to master, and I think Dr. Williams mentioned this to me the other day, but um, it's possible to put you guys into groups, right? Yes. Like breakout rooms or something like that. Yeah, breakout rooms. Breakout rooms. I have no clue how to do that. Um, but you know what? Actually, we're, we're, there's so few of us, we don't even need to. Uh, <laughs> but okay, so what do you guys think? Uh, how, do you, how do you discipline this, this child? Uh, let's start with Fiona. Um, well, personally, instead of, you know, because usually parents would start like hitting them or, you know, yelling at them back, I would actually try to have a conversation with a child and explain to them what is it that they want and why do they want the cereal instead of like making them understand why they can't get it, you know, because if you just smack the child, I don't think they will, I mean, they will throw tantrums whenever they want something. And if you give them what they want, then that will be a kind of worse because they will throw a tantrum, even if they're <clears throat> even if they're adults, they will want, you know, they will throw a tantrum just to get what they want. So I think that what I would do is just try to have a conversation and uh, utilize as much <laughs> like as possible. <laughs> so 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 you try to appeal to their 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 reason. Yes. Okay. All right, that's that's fair. We'll talk about that. Uh, Elisa and then Nolan. Um, okay, I think, like, the reason why, like, me and, like, my siblings were never like that was because, like, my mom, like, had us very lined out, like, she had explained to us, like, she would have conversations with us, kind of like what Fiona was saying, that, like, like, that's not what you do, like, she was like, that's just gonna get you in more trouble, like, I'm not gonna, like, get it for you, like, she never gave in to anything like that, so, like, I think that's really true, like, you have to, like, talk to a child, and you have to, like, explain to them, like, why it is that like things are going on why they can't do this and like why like this isn't like a socially acceptable like behavior and all that and, and so you would say and and, and your mother might talk to you about this like you know before this incident were to ever happen just so it's already established like this is this is not acceptable behavior yeah okay all right that's fair uh nolan Wait, no yeah, go ahead i would actually yell at them like okay. loud like what would you yell? basically to give them a reason? Um, something like, simple like stop being or stop complaining or just to give them a reaction, like to embarrass them, to give them a reaction that they don't want again. So it's like it's kind of the same purpose as trying to explain it to them reasonably, but instead of like I feel like it's just easier to yeah appeal to like their fears instead of like their rationality. Like, if I'm yelling at the kid. They know not that they don't want that same reaction again. 
So it won't act in the same way to, to produce that reaction. It's not like, yeah, it's an indirect way of teaching them that this is not acceptable. So, so you would shame Instead them? Of, like lining it up. Yeah. Shame them. Okay. I mean, shame is a very powerful social tool, folks. Uh, okay. All right. That, that, that's an interesting answer. Uh, back, uh, Dorothy? Uh, okay. Yeah. I was a tamper tantrum child. Um, <laughs> Were you really? Yeah, I was. Um, so I kind of... I kind of, I kind of agree with Nolan, um, like, I feel like you'd have to, like, just because, like, that's all I know, like, the way, like, the four things that you mentioned, like, before, like, um, docile bodies and, like, panopticism things, like, I feel like I would take that into, like, um, consideration, like, I would probably, like, yell at my kid, and I'd be like, look, everyone's watching, like, you're embarrassing me, like, this is so embarrassing, look, everyone can see you doing this and, like, making a scene, so, like, yeah, I feel like that's what I would do. Because I feel like at, when a child is throwing a tamper tantrum, like, you can talk to them reasonably, but I don't feel like they're able to see your reason when they're in the middle of a tamper tantrum. So I feel like you need to hit them with a strong wave of emotion first and then start to reason it out after. Okay, interesting. Okay, so I'm hearing two different answers. So Fiona and Elisa said, you know, be, be a little more reasonable, explain, you know, what, what's wrong to the child. But then some of you are saying, no, 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 you have to shame them right away. So already I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm sensing some disagreement. Uh, good, good, good. Um, but but in, insightful um, comment. Uh, somebody hasn't spoken yet, uh, Daphna, Christine, Sophia, what would you do? Your kid just starts throwing cereal all over the supermarket. Oh, come on, guys. Let's have, okay, Daphne. I mean, see, I understand why like publicly shaming them would work like Dorothy and Nolan were saying, but the thing is at the same time, I don't, like I, I understand why it works and I understand why trying to talk to them rationally in that situation doesn't, but I don't think that creating a relationship between the child and the parent where the child has to constantly fear the parent is a good one. So, that like it, it's really putting me in a tough situation and trying to think of what I would actually do because that's like the last I the last thing I want is for my child to like constantly fear me like I understand they have to respect the parent but like fear and respect I mean they can be the same but they can also be different I would rather if they were separated you know mm. okay, so, so you would say it's not good for a child to fear a parent yeah mm, interesting interesting uh, it, it really depends on how you were raised um oh, uh Elisa back to Elisa go ahead Okay, like what Dorothy was saying, that, um, that like obviously like in that moment they're not going to listen to you because like they're like going at it. But um, I think that's why you have to like establish that beforehand. Like you have to have like taught them that like the people do these things and like that are they're not okay. And like that when you go to the store, like you teach them like before go ever going to the store, like what is like proper store behavior, you know, so that they like how already have that established beforehand and like that's why they like they're not going to listen to you in that moment but like that prevents it ever from happening okay and and so you would say this the best discipline is preemptive like you should discipline them before you get into a situation like this yeah like not like yeah like discipline and like um to like beat a child are completely two different things like you can like just teach them nicely you know like just yeah. be nice to them no, that's right. Oh, hold on. Before we continue this, um, let's continue this conversation. But I've noticed that I don't think anybody here advocates for 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 like physically disciplining the child, right? Like all of you seem to be against that, unless I'm wrong. Unless sometimes you just need the you guys are brown la chancla. Definitely not <laughs> physical discipline. No, I disagree. Yeah, no, I'm not for physical discipline either. Not extreme physical discipline. Well, yeah, okay. Nobody's talking about child abuse, but I'm talking about like, what about like spanking or, you know. Um... No, I can't no. do that. <laughs> no. no. Not effective. Well, I mean, it's effective, but I just, I'm not strong enough for that. <laughs> uh, you'd be shocked how, if, if you were mad. Uh, Fiona, I'm sorry, you're, 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 you're waiting patiently. Go ahead. Oh, it's okay. No, I... <laughs> Well, to just go to your point, I don't think that, you know, well, my parents, um, they read a lot of books before I was born. They really wanted to see what was the best way, I guess, to raise me. So they read a lot of books and a lot of books had to do with the worst thing you can do is to 
if, when a child is angry or starts crying, um, the worst thing to do is to start hitting them or screaming at them because they will not understand why. They just want the parent's attention. So if you, you give them that attention and actually try to make them reason about it, I do, I, I, I do have to say that when I was little, I do remember my parents explaining to me, hey, what you're doing, it's, it's this, but they start explaining. And when they explain, it's, you know, you kind of understand. And especially there's this line that they always told me, and it was, um, it was like, I need you to understand. When they say, I need you to understand, they're giving you, I guess, your place and uh, the fact that you can reason. And I guess they kind of give you a, um, the fact that you're intelligent enough to actually understand the situation. And so I kind of, you know, I kind of understood and I never really, you know, put on a temper tantrum when I was little. I was, you know, it was um, when a parent explains and gives a child that attention that they need when they're alive. Because usually when people, when children are throwing temper tantrums, it's because they need that attention. And if the attention is not given, then they will just continue to do that for the rest of their lives, even when they're adults. No, I mean, that, that, that's a really good point. And uh, I, I guess what you're saying is it needs to be properly explained to a child why this is bad, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, because when that happens, then the, the, they will understand. Like, I, I remember when I was little, I don't know why I have been in my brain, like, engraved that. But I do remember my parents talking to me like, okay, well, you did is wrong because of the, they didn't tell me it was wrong. They just said, there's, there are better options than what you did. And so when they give me more options and you're like, oh, okay. I prefer that option <laughs> instead of this one. Good, no, excellent, excellently said, Fiona. Uh, okay, uh, last comment, then we'll move on. Uh, Dorothy? Uh, okay, actually, I don't know. Fiona's been changing my mind a lot today. <laughs> but, like, mm -hmm. okay, because I actually wanted to, like, pick up on the point that Dolphin was talking about, where, like, it's better to have a relationship where you're talking to a kid than to fear a kid. And I just want to clarify, I don't think that a relationship of fear between a parent and a child is correct what i'm saying is that in the moment of a tamper tantrum um it can be effective because i feel like there are boundaries that oftentimes need to be set in between children and parents um and so maybe that's just the way i was raised because I, I feel like that really influences the way we see like parenting um but i feel like tamper tantrums like kind of cross that boundary and so a little bit of like a stronger act is like necessary to like set the kids straight. And I also like primarily also agree with Lisa's point. I think you should talk to your kid beforehand. So it's not an issue preventative measures rather than fixing it later. But yeah, that's just my point of view. Okay, no, that's fair. And I think you're very insightful to bring up the fact that uh, your point of view on parenting obviously really depends on the way that you were raised. Um, and, uh, you know, it's funny, I think the old fashioned way of viewing parenting is, you know, uh, physical punishment was seen as the norm. Uh, you know, uh, there's an expression, right? Spare the rod, spoil the child. And, uh, you know, if your child was acting up, you just, you know, threatened to give them a good spanking or something and then they would fall in line. The point that I'm trying to make is in today's modern, more rational world, we think of that as totally unnecessary at best. And at worst, it's kind of, you know, cruel and, and barbaric but we still have to have methods of disciplining children. And so discipline has simply become more nuanced and more rational. So you would try and talk with the child, try to convince them. But let's say that you simply cannot convince this child, either because they're just so rebellious or because they're just too young to understand. In that case, uh, what, what, what um, Dorothy was mentioning earlier, shame is a really powerful tool. You don't have to hit the kid to get them to do what you want. You can shame them into doing what you want. With uh, We'll go over this later, but... <laughs> the gaze of the other. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really want you to seriously think uh, how you would discipline a child. Although you guys gave very good answers. You usually get way worse. I usually get one kid that says like, oh yeah, I would totally beat them. Um, so good on you. Uh, you guys will make good parents one day if you want to. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> now, the most important step though, says Foucault, to establishing discipline though, is to establish what's called a docile body. Or in other words, you can't control, let's say your child, if your child is running around doing whatever. If they're running around the supermarket, if they're throwing things off of shelves, if they're like, you know, crying and throwing themselves on the floor, then you can't maintain any kind of discipline. 
Foucault said step one of maintaining discipline, you must control the subject's body. You know, like their physical body, you have to control their space, like where they are, at what time, et cetera, et cetera. You have to establish what he calls a docile body. That's the first step. You cannot talk to your child until you first get them to sit still. And so how do you get somebody to like sit still and do what you want them to do? That's what we're gonna go over today. And so I don't want you to think of today as like a manual for parenting. I just want you to think about how institutions use these same techniques to discipline you and how you indirectly contribute to these when raising children, um, with, uh, with peers at your school, et cetera, et cetera. So let's get into it. Everyone ready? I didn't wait for response. I just went. Docile bodies. Foucault pointed out that discipline common in monasteries, armies, and workshops were becoming increasingly normal in all aspects of modern life. So where before, like in a monastery, for instance, like this very like regimented, very like timetable oriented um, uh, way of life, that used to be the abnormal way of doing things. So monasteries, uh, armies, uh, workshops, these like highly regimented, very rational, very timetable oriented activities and professions, those used to be like the exception but now they are increasingly becoming the norm. Everybody's on a timetable, almost everybody, whatever job you're on. Uh, I mean, heck, why do, again, why do you think they instituted a block schedule for Cleveland? Uh, it's, it's to maintain discipline uh, for everyone, for, for, for students and teachers alike, because uh, maybe some teachers weren't uh, posting anything. Maybe, you know, they, they, there was, and then some teachers were conflicting with other teachers in terms of time slots. It was an effective tool to get people to become more rational. But guys, why do you think that they're asking you to get up at nine in the morning to go to online class? Look at the title of this slide. To make us docile bodies. Yes, because the first step to controlling anybody is to control their body. And so if you can control somebody's body, in this case, making you wake up at a certain hour, they're maintaining discipline. Now, let me just take a quick break here. Foucault is of the opinion that this is all very bad and negative. I want you to, to think critically. Maybe you agree with Foucault and you think like, yeah, this is horrible. This takes away individual freedom, which it does. But you could also make the counter argument, well, it's not all bad. I mean, discipline can also be good. Um, and being disciplined could be a good thing. Like, is it really bad to wake up early? In some ways, yeah, it sucks. But in other ways, you are more productive. And, uh, and if you have a, a routine sleep schedule, you actually sleep better. Um, so I don't know. I want you to think about it. Is this all bad? But okay, so that was the, that was the point I wanted to make there. Your body is not your own. Let me explain what I mean by that. Um, when, when Foucault says your body is not your own, think about it. You're often told where to stand, where to sit, where you can go, where you can't go, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is especially true right now during a quarantine. <laughs> Uh, more than that, however, there are tiny details in your everyday routine that treat you and your body as nothing more than a machine. Uh, this is Foucault's big metaphor for a docile body. You might want to make a quick note here. He says, in the process of making someone into a docile body, you treat them in the same way you would treat a machine. Um, let, let, I'll explain that metaphor in just a moment. But you, when you really stop and think about it, okay, obviously, like now in the quarantine, you know, it's very explicit. You can't go outside and interact with people. But even during like a normal school day, uh, you know, you're told exactly what period to go to, where you can go, where you can't go. Even something like to go use the restroom, you need a pass, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like your body is actually really highly regulated and regimented and put on this very strict timetable. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect just, sense. Just checking. <laughs> okay. So, a machine. That's a cool little graphic. Is it popping up for you guys? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. So let me explain what I mean by a machine. Um, okay. Like, how do we typically treat a machine? Like, uh, I don't know. Like, like for instance, your computer right now. Like, how do, how do we treat a machine compared to a human being? Like, is there a difference? God, I hope there's a difference between the way you treat other people and the way you treat your computer. What's the difference? Or differences, I guess. Nolan? Well, a machine is more predictable in terms of its behavior. Like, you know exactly how it's going to act and you can interact with it accordingly. Whereas a human is up to someone else's consciousness, so more subjective. 
Ex very insightful, extremely right. Uh, a human being has free will, has a consciousness, and so you never quite 100% know what they're doing or what they're thinking, but a computer or a machine is far more predictable. And if it doesn't do what you predicted it to do, then there's something wrong with the machine. You know, if you try to turn on your computer and it's not turning on, there's something wrong with the machine. It's not like the computer could just choose like, eh, let me sleep another hour. Like that, that's silly, a, a, a machine doesn't work in that way. You want predictive powers over a machine. And if it doesn't do what you expect it to do, then it's broken and it needs to be fixed. Now consider how that's the way that institutions tend to view people, not as human beings with a consciousness and a free will, but as machines that have to be regulated, well-maintained, but ultimately you have to fulfill a particular function or purpose. And every single institution is like this. Every single institution aims to turn you into a machine. Let's take one solid example, and this is from the reading, a soldier. In the past, uh, soldiers were viewed as a particular kind of person, usually a man, and there was a particular sort of like a uh, set of qualities that made someone into a soldier. Like for instance, lots of, uh, you know, in, in the traditional world, people would say like, oh yeah, that guy looks like a soldier because, you know, he's big, he's tall, he's got like broad shoulders, he looks, you know, tough, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he looks like he's brave. You know, he's got a certain like way of acting, a certain way of talking. And the assumption was that some people are born to be great soldiers and some, you know, aren't. And the focus is on, you know, uh, people being born into these particular characteristics and these particular circumstances. Uh, uh, soldiers are born. We have a totally different view now. In fact, how do we view soldiers now, you think? Can you guys see me? Because I'm making faces at the camera. Yes, we can see your face. Okay, good, okay. So uh, I'll repeat my question. So in the past, they used to think that soldiers were born. Like, you know, you, you can't just like, not just anybody can be a good soldier. Like it, it takes a particular kind of person to be a soldier. We have a very point, different point of view today. Uh, how do you think we view soldiers today? Dorothy? Dorothy? Sorry. So yeah, I feel like this is kind of like growth versus fixed mindset. Like people back then like believe like, oh, you're born this way. And that's like the only thing like that's all you have to deal with. Whereas now we're very much like, oh, like you can like work to do this. Yes. Although it's a little more sinister than that, but you're not wrong. Uh, Christine. You know, the song from Mulan, like the I'll make a man out of you song. It's yeah. like, that, you know, like if you go into the program, they'll just make you into a soldier. Like even if you suck at it. Very good, precisely, Christine. The idea now is not that soldiers are born. The idea now is that soldiers are made, molded. Doesn't matter who you are or where you come from. If you join the Marine Corps, we'll make you into a Marine. Uh, and they have a system of regimented discipline that will make you into a Marine. As long as you follow orders and you do what they tell you to do, they're gonna turn you into a machine. In this case, a soldier machine. Um, Oh my God, sorry, now you just have me thinking of Mulan. Is, is, is that movie gonna come out? The live action one? Or yeah, the it is. They're postponing the release of it. Uh, they should just do it through Disney Plus. It'd probably make them a lot of money. Uh, if, you're, if you're listening to Disney, which I know you are, that's what you should do. Um, <laughs> anyway, but yeah, okay. Uh, let's get down to business to defeat the Huns. Cool. So a soldier, is no longer somebody who is born a particular way, you know, with a particular body or a particular mindset. A soldier is now literally anybody who goes through this system of discipline and regimentation. Soldiers are made. So I wanna share with you a movie clip. I don't know if you guys have ever seen uh, Full Metal Jacket. Anyone ever seen this one? It's by, uh, it's by Stanley Kubrick, the same guy who directed The Shining. No? I, I have not seen it. I, I haven't seen it. I take your silence to know. Okay. It's a great movie, uh, really intense. It's about the Vietnam War. Um, and so the movie's kind of like split into two parts. The first half of the movie is uh, this, this group of guys as they join boot camp for the Marines. And the second half of the movie is them actually in Vietnam. And so uh, I want to show you a very famous scene. It's, it's only about five minutes long, but it's a very infamous scene where this uh, drill sergeant, um, the, 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 so you can see him in the picture there. Uh, he, he actually, so the actor was actually a drill sergeant in real life. And so when Stanley Kubrick, they just, they asked, he asked him, can you just like do what you would normally do in like the barracks? The guy was like, oh yeah, no problem. And so he just like 
well, I'll just show you the clip, but uh, warning, there is a lot of profanity, like a lot of profanity, and uh, a lot of it's a little explicit, but uh, no, no violence, just a lot of cursing. You guys ready? I'm, I'm gonna send you the link. Oh, hold on, sorry folks, ah, one second. Sorry, I, I had it open, but I think I closed the tab because I'm a moron. I am gonna. Oh, got it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna put the link in the chat. Actually, wait. Can we all watch it together? Would that be better? No, but then the audio is probably gonna be kind of bad, huh? I mean, you could try it. Try it. Yeah, let me know how the audio is. Hold on. Okay, can everyone see it? Yes. Okay, uh, I'm going to play for just a few seconds. Let me know how the audio sounds. I am Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, your senior drill instructor. From now on, you will speak only when spoken. Was that okay? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. That's okay. Okay, then I'm just gonna play the clip. Everyone ready? Again, warning, a lot of cursing. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, actually, shoot, no, I can't, I can't show, because if I show this, then YouTube is going to, uh, to ban it when, 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 when I post it up later. You could like maybe trim the clip or something. Like if you, if you can save this recording, like go back and maybe edit it or something. All right. Or you could just right. send oh. us the clip and we'll watch it. Yeah, whatever's more convenient. Like YouTube. Uh, all right, let, let's just watch it. I'll, I'll, I'll take my chances with YouTube. Here. <laughs> I think so. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Okay, now for real. Sorry, sorry. I am Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, your senior drill instructor. From now on, you will speak only when spoken to. And the first and last words out of your filthy sewers will be, sir. Do you maggots understand that? Sir, yes, sir. Bullshit, I can't hear you. Sound off like you got a pair. Sir, yes, sir. If you ladies leave my island, if you survive recruit training, you will be a weapon. You will be a minister of death praying for war. But until that day, you are pukes. You are the lowest form of life on earth. You are not even human fucking beings. You are nothing but unorganized, grabastic pieces of amphibian shit. Because I am hard, you will not like me. But the more you hate me, the more you will learn. I am hard, but I am fair. There is no racial bigotry here. I do not look down on niggers, kites, wops, or greasers. Here you are all equally worthless. And my orders are to weed out all non-hackers who do not pack the gear to serve in my beloved soul. Hey, you maggots understand that? Sir, yes, sir. Bullshit, I can't hear you. Sir, yes, sir. What's your name, scumbag? Sir, Private Brown, sir. Bullshit, from now on, you're Private Snowball. Do you like that name? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Well, there's one thing that you won't like, Private Snowball. They don't serve fried chicken and watermelon on a daily basis in my mess hall. Oh, uh, yes, sir. You, John Wayne, is this me? Who said that? Who the fuck said that? Who's the slimy little cop with a shit twinkle toe cocksucker down here who just signed his own death warrant? Nobody, huh? The very fucking godmother said it. I'll fucking stand it. I will PT you all until you fucking die. I'll PT you until your assholes are sucking buttermilk. What's it, you, you scroungy little fuck? Huh? Sir, no, sir. You little piece of shit, you look like a fucking worm. I better warn you. Sir, no, sir. Sir, I said it, sir. Well, no shit. What have we got here? A fucking comedian, private joker. I admire your honesty. Hell, I like you. You can come over to my house and fuck my sister. <clears throat> you little scumbag. I got your name. I got your ass. You will not laugh. You will not cry. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. Now get up. Get on your feet. You had best unfuck yourself or I will unscrew your head and shit down your neck. Sir, yes, sir. Private Joker, why did you join my beloved cult? Sir, to kill, sir. So you're a killer. Sir, yes, sir. Let me see your war face. Sir, you got a war face? 
infamous uh, scene from uh, Stanley Kubrick's film LJ. It's a great movie if you've never watched it. Uh, <laughs> what'd you guys think of that? That was very intense. Um, I thought it was funny. Yeah, it was uh, a lo lot of cursing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and so that guy, that actor actually was a drill sergeant in real life. Uh, that's, that's why they hired him. <laughs> so pretty intense. Anyway, so the point I wanted to reach with that is, again, soldiers are no longer thought of as like, you know, oh, you're like really, like you're born to be a soldier. Now it's like, oh, you're literally anybody and we're gonna turn you into a Marine or, you know, whatever. Um, I want you to relate, I'm using soldiers, the army is an example, but relate this to school. In the past, the prevailing view used to be, um, oh, some people are just smarter than others. Like some people are just born to be, you know, scholars or, or you know, some people are just born to kind of go to college. You know, th th some people have a predisposition to that. But now the prevailing notion is, no, 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 with the right discipline, we can turn anybody into a successful student. Um, you don't have to necessarily have a certain you know, range of categories or even desire to want to be a, a good student. We're going to turn you into one. Same thing with soldiers. Does that make sense? Yeah, a lot makes sense now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Anyway, back to the PowerPoint. Almost done. <clears throat> Okay, so how does that movie clip illustrate Foucault's point about docile bodies? Um, for, so how did this clip I just showed you from Full Metal Jacket, how does it demonstrate the point about docile bodies? Fiona. I mean, they were literally, <laughs> you can't move them. They were so rigid and they, looked like technically machines, I'm right there to say, because they didn't move at all. Even if they did move, they still were placed in discipline back again to whatever the, the, the officer said. That's right, yeah, and, and, and if you watch the whole movie, um, you're gonna see that the, the whole of uh, boot camp is like that. I mean, everything is just so regimented, everything is just so like drilled into them that yeah, there's not a whole lot of room for you know, personal freedom. Uh, yeah, that's right. Their bodies are quite literally controlled. Um, anything else? Any other uh, connections that you saw? Uh, to docile bodies, this idea of like keeping people in line? Okay, all right, in that case, we'll move on. Well, uh, but it, it, can you guys hear me or are you just being quiet? We can hear you. We can hear you. You're just being quiet. Is, is my question unclear? I think it's, it's very clear. Oh, like it's so obvious that you don't even want to answer it. I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, which well is Fiona said it was good. Okay, all right, fair enough, fine. Okay, <laughs> so you understand why I showed you the clip? As an example. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, thank God. Let's <laughs> go. oh. 
Okay, you guys could do me a huge favor and turn to page 19. I just want to read one little thing with you guys from page 19 in the reading. By the way, if we finish the lecture early, I'm not going to hold you until 1030. Like, we can end early uh, if you guys are quick. So go ahead and turn to page 19 in the reading. Um, uh, go ahead. Uh, is, is Schoology up? I'm checking. <laughs> it, it's not I have it downloaded like the... Yeah, I think it's up. Oh, smart, smart. Yeah, and if you haven't if you haven't downloaded the the reading, I I, I would do so. Um, the next chance you get. You guys ready? Give me like a little thumbs up emoji or say something. Mm -hmm. Ready. Daphne's ready. Ready. Are there, is, is school yet? Um, I don't know for me. It's still, it's lo like downloading and I can't, I can't get it. Yeah, same. <laughs> Mine isn't loading. Oh, really? It works for me. On my phone, it's not loading, but like I haven't tried on my laptop, but I already have the packet. Okay. All right. Well, in that case, I just want to read one little part uh, at the bottom of page nine. <clears throat> I just want to read one, well, I just want to go over one passage with you guys, because I think this is the part that relates mostly to you as students. <clears throat> Modern armies like to recruit individuals when they are young, but they are most impressionable and then build their skills over time. But school is probably the area where age grouping has had the widest influence in society. Put yourself into the school that Foucault describes in the following passage. From the 17th century to the introductions, this, this is Foucault now. At the beginning of the 19th of century of the Lancaster method, the complex clockwork of the mutual improvement school was built up cog by cog. First, the oldest pupils were entrusted with tasks involving simple supervision, then of checking work, then of teaching. The school became a machine for learning. I like that, uh, so let me just pause for a second. So, okay, it, it seems to be easier to understand how discipline works in the army. I mean, that's so explicit, right? But what's not necessarily as explicit is school. But school is, he, Foucault says the same thing as an army or even a prison or a mental hospital. He says they're all basically the same. They're all trying to maintain discipline and order. And so you are turned into a machine. And it, when you think about the magnet program especially, I mean, that's very obvious. Um, what, is the what kind of machine is this institution, the magnet program, trying to turn you into? Because we are trying to turn you into a machine, but what kind of machine? A socially conscious machine. Yep, perhaps a socially conscious machine. What else? Think about like all the writing we make you do, all of the work we make you do. Like what, what else? Well, what kind of machine are we trying to make you? So yeah, socially conscious machine, but what else? Like just literate in general? Yeah, like a, a reading and writing machine, a, uh, a student machine, like uh, being able to, well, and, and, and what's, what's implicit is a college machine, a college student. We're trying to make you, because colleges have a certain expectation of the kind of person that you're going to be. And so we have been attempting to mold you to be that kind of person. And by the way, there is a particular kind of like archetype to the core kid. I'm sure you guys know that. Um, and what's the ultimate expression of that? When someone comes back and teaches. <laughs> I mean, guys, like, you guys know half of our faculty are former students, right? Yes. <laughs> Insane. Yeah, like, it, th that's really unusual. So I think that kind of uh, demonstrates a lot of the success of the magnet, where we are very good at turning people into, like, core machines. Um, obviously, me, I mean, who else? Uh, Dr. Williams, Mr. Saavedra, Ms. Del Pino, Mr. Kim, uh, Ms. Enman, uh, uh, Mr. Silva, um, uh, uh, not Basinger, but Basinger's wife, Mr. Leconte's wife, so, so they're court in-laws. Uh, who am I missing? I feel like I'm missing somebody. Well, anyway, it'll come back to me. But like, yeah, like, like about half of our staff are former students. And I think that only, uh, you know, shows the success of the program and what's its goal? To maintain discipline and turn people into machines, like core machines, if that makes sense. So, reading on. <clears throat> uh, the school became a machine for learning. In a school of 360 children, the master would not be able to give half a minute each. By the new method, each of the 360 pupil writers reads or counts for two and a half hours. 
This carefully measured combination of forces requires a precise system of command. All the activity of the disciplined individual must be punctuated and sustained by commands that must trigger off the required behavior. Place the little bodies in a, I'm sorry, place the bodies in a little world of signals, bells, clapping of hands, gestures, a mere glance from the teacher. So, okay, I want you to realize something, and uh, this is what Foucault tries to point out too. Schools do not institute bell schedules and don't have discipline just for fun. It's, it's, it's required. I mean, think about how many students are there in a school. Look, if our class was just this size, like if it was just like a handful of you, then it'd be much easier for, you know, uh, relationships between students and, 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 and their peers and other teachers to be more intimate. It could be, you know, easier to like, you know, communicate, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you guys know how many students I have? I mean, like I teach the entirety of 12th grade core. So I have like 200 of you. So I do not have time, practically speaking, to give every single one of you the same amount of attention. Um, and, and furthermore, not all of you need the same amount of attention. Some of you need less, some of you need more, sometimes you need less, sometimes you need more. And so it's impossible for one teacher to be able to accommodate the needs of all of his or her students. And so these methods of discipline are out of practicality more than anything else. Um, and so I don't want you to think of like, oh, this has intentionally been made to be this big, scary, evil system. A lot of it is practicality. There's just too many students um, to be able to like, you know, let them to kind of do whatever they want. They have to be in uh, control. Their bodies have to be controlled. Uh, Nolan, go ahead, uh, comment. So I know schools in like Scandinavia, like Sweden and stuff are very different in that it's less like standardized and disciplined more like catering to individual needs and stuff like would would Foucault advocate for a system more like that or ideally yeah but I know what you're talking about and um those countries are lucky enough to have oh you know what the single biggest factor is they've determined this like it's a well-known fact in the world of teaching you know what the single biggest factor is for student success in a classroom like the single most important factor what is it classroom size the smaller the classroom size, the better the students yeah. will do, generally speaking. That, that, that's the single biggest factor. And so unfortunately, with a huge district like LAUSD, we just don't have that kind of opportunity. We don't have that many teachers, A, and then we don't have that many facilities and we have too many students. And so as a result, we can't realistically and practically give all the students the same amount of attention. And so that's why we have these very regimented systems of control. Um, yeah, in an ideal world, you'd have very small classrooms, like 10 to 15 uh, kids. Um, but that's not the way the cookie crumbles. I mean, that's just not practical. Um, I mean, you, you guys are in classes of like, shoot, like 50 kids, right? Like 40 to 50 kids sometimes? Yes, especially in 11th grade when they placed all of us in just that four. Like, yeah, it was. Oh, yeah, God, that's like, that's like 60 kids in a room. Um, I mean, there's just, there's just no way that you can, you know, um, uh, you know, give, give any student any kind of individual attention uh, when, when, they're, um, when they're like one out of like, you know, 50 kids. There's just no way. So you have to maintain these very tight systems of discipline and order. Okay. So to conclude, you are what Foucault would call a machine. You are molded, shaped, programmed by your modern institutions to behave a very particular way to achieve very specific goals, whether that's school or, or church or even a family unit. All of that is just an institution made to control you. And guess what? Those institutions have gotten very good at making you a docile body. Like the first step to control is controlling your body, where you are, where you can go, et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna go over the details of that next time. That'll be, oh God, not until next uh, Monday. Uh, but, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Fiona, go ahead. Um, so would you also argue that TV is also kind of, I'm not gonna say an institution, but um, for example, yeah. the fact that you have TVs at certain time, or like I heard that the you know, shows at certain times. I mean, I don't have a TV, but, because of that particular reason, like we don't like, we feel like the programming comes from mostly from movies and things like that because it's visually seeing. So I do think that, I don't know, I was just asking if that's also part of like an institution as a whole. 
No, no, uh, the media would definitely count. Yes. In fact, uh, there's another, the, another um, institution that you guys are part of that uh, Mr. Silva is going to go over in more detail. So, uh, social, uh, or, uh, in uh, social institutions, you're going to go over social media. Uh, social media is really what has impacted um, a lot of your behavior. And social media quite literally turns you into a docile body because when you're looking at Instagram or TikTok, uh, you're probably stationary. Like you're probably sitting down or lying down. Um, your body is quite literally pacified by the programs. I mean, yeah, so makes sense. <laughs> so when you guys are browsing through Instagram, you're probably on your bed, or you're probably sitting at your desk or something, right? I mean, like, uh, I doubt you guys are like, maybe you're like slowly walking around. Um, you know, honestly, like before, I just got Instagram this school year because I didn't want it. But the only reason I had to get it is because the school would make announcements on Instagram and I wouldn't get them. And so I said, I don't want to get Instagram. <laughs> But then in the end, I got it <laughs> because I needed to know. And there's so many announcements that they make there that I wouldn't have known if I didn't have Instagram. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's, it's useful to be in the know. Now, me personally, I hate social media. Uh, I mean, I deleted my Instagram account like a year ago. And I only remade it because of this crisis because I want to be in contact with more people. Um, I don't like social media for a lot of reasons that we're going to get into. And primarily a big part of it is because it, it pacifies your body. It makes you into a docile body. You're less likely to be critical and you're less likely to rebel against those institutions if you're just kept really, um, again, the word is docile. So this leads to, yes, this idea of docile bodies. Um, I mean, I wonder how many of you, because because listen, I, I take Zoom classes right now through, um, you know, uh, CSUN. And so I know that a lot of you are probably like on your phones and probably even left the room and came back. Uh, so just kind of sound off to let me know you're here. I'm here. Okay, hold I'm on. Here. Oh, hey, Tiffany. You're, you're a little early, Tiffany. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. Who, who, who said? Was that Christine? Oh, okay, I, have, I have a question. Dorothy. Dorothy, what's, what's that? The, what's the meeting ID for this? Oh, uh, give me one sec. I can check. Uh, sorry, sorry. I, I gotta stop sharing for a second. Um, one second. Oh, wait, I got it. I got it. I got it. Hold on. I just put it, I'm gonna put it in the chat. There you go. Oh, thank you. Okay, so sorry. Uh, I, I literally just have like one more slide to go over and then, then I'll take questions, then we'll conclude for today. Uh, okay, so docile bodies. <clears throat> so, quick review of what we covered today. Uh, we did a very brief review of discussion board number nine that was uh, which is more cruel or I'm sorry which is more humane public executions or uh, timetables. We did the thought experiment of the spoiled brat. Um, we went over what it does it mean to have a docile bodies. Uh, you are a machine. Uh, and, and we went over the, ex the examples with, um, with uh, the army. So this week and next we'll be going over the techniques of discipline. So docile bodies, means of correct training, panopticism, and the other. So today we covered the first one, docile bodies. So next lesson will be the means of correct training. Okay, so today's homework is to root to page uh, 20 and uh, answer discussion board number 10. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it, uh, period one. I know you guys had to wake up a little bit earlier for that. Um, so thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to stop uh, recording in three, two, one. Thank you guys. <laughs>